Hello guys this is your friend. And we are back with our new fanfic. Which is. What if Naruto was disowned by his family and he went to Kumo. Part 1. The link of this fanfic is in the description. And if you enjoy this fanfic then please press the like button. And please subscribe to the channel it motivates me to upload more fanfics like these for you all. Now let's start the fanfic. The blonde haired young boy of four knew that his name was Monster. It was either that or Demon. Actually, considering the damp, cold and smelly place he was in at the moment, he was sure this was the lair of a demon, him. The elderly lady had told him that he was a worthless monster, who simply had to stay put and get kicked and punched by the other boys and even the girls of the orphanage, they slept in beds, because they were humans. He was a monster, and thus he had to sleep in the cellar. It wasn't that bad, at least if he was thirsty he'd just have to lick some water off the walls, sure, it was freezing. Sure, he had to give his scraps of food to the mice, it was that or his fingers you know. He was just lucky he was able to mend his bones by sleeping all night, and more than sleeping he couldn't do anything else in there. Recently the headmistress had decided to directly shackle him with a chain in a corner of the cellar, because he had learned how to actually walk, and not crawl on the ground. He had watched a mouse stand on his two legs, and had tried to imitate him, after all, the mice were his only, well friend would be far-fetched, but still, they were his only willing living beings that lived with him. Furthermore they didn't even hit him, or yell things at him. He shivered, not for the cold, never for the cold, he was used to that, but because of the songs outside. He recognized it, it was the same song that was sung for the festivity of the defeat of the Kayubi, the nine-tailed beast, the monster who had attacked the village the same night he was born. That was what the story told, he had been born and then puff, the Kayubi had attacked, so it was his fault. He didn't know what to think of it, though if he actually had done that, he wasn't sure he could repeat the feat, he had tried, whispering the name of that beast for a while, thinking that if it ever attacked again, at least he'd have a chance at a normal life, and maybe, maybe, they'd give the fall to someone else born on that day. He shook his head, it was an evil thought, giving the fall to others. Everything was always his fault after all, he was sure of that, the headmistress had told him that personally. He had one day of happiness though, it was the day the Hokage, known as Minato Namikaze, came to visit the orphanage, on that day he was first severely beaten in the morning, then dressed, and he was told that he was to be a good boy and say he was happy there then he'd be given a piece of cake by the end of the day. The piece was always small, less than a thumb wide and an index long, but it was still cake. He had to be quick though, because once the Hokage left he was undressed of all but the bare essential, thrown in the cellars again, and he had to grab the flying piece of cake before any mouse could get to it. Sure, they liked it too, but they didn't share like he did. They had told him that the Hokage had defeated the demon once, and that, had he not been good and silent, he would kill him too, after all, to defeat the demon, the third Hokage, Hiruzen Serutobi, sacrificed himself in the fight. Still, he was glad for the Hokage's visits, because every now and then he'd come with some candy, not that he'd get any, as the headmistress would always grab it before anyone, and then share it at dinner, with the rest of the kids. So, he was shivering and waiting the usual beating. That's when the cellar's door opened, and the headmistress came down, a plump lady with bright pink hair, Haruno something. She was really important in the council, and she even said that if she wanted, she could have him killed because he was evil. Now, now, monster, she spoke with spite, always with spite and anger, today is going to be special. He closed his eyes, he knew it, he was going to get beaten, and it was better to keep his hands down, otherwise they'd kill him for defending himself. That's when he heard the chain strangling his neck coming loose, and he looked with surprise at the lady. Off you go. Go outside and have fun, now. He slowly crawled into a crouched position, but since he was too slow, 
the headmistress simply yanked him upwards and with strength held his right arm in a grip. It hurt, but he simply whimpered, if he started crying it would be worst. His legs were too short to actually keep up the fast walk of the headmistress, so he was simply yanked every now and then with strong pulls that hurt a lot. He was at the door, and could see that outside, there was already a mob forming. He gulped down nervously, looking with a glint of fear at the headmistress, face, who was grinning with a wicked smile. Then, he threw him outside, in the middle of the mob, and closed the door of the orphanage behind her. On another road, a happy family of three was smiling and looking through the stalls, people stopping to congratulate the Hokage, Minato Namikaze, for his job of protecting them against the beast. On his right stood his beautiful red-haired wife, Kashina Uzumaki Namikaze, and in the middle stood their little princess, Katsumi Namikaze, she had red hair like her mother, but clear blue eyes like her father. She wore a pretty pink kimono, just like her mother's, while Minato was wearing his Hokage's outfit. His thought for once went to his other son, the one he had failed to protect, and he couldn't help but feel a twinge of guilt, as he looked at his wife, who had, her too, a sad smile on her face, hidden to her best ability, for their daughter, Katsumi, Kashina was thinking about the children she had lost that night, years ago. When the Kayubi attacked, Minato had to seal his chakra into a newborn baby, and, as fate would have it, Kashina had managed to push out both of the twins from her belly, a boy and a girl. He had to choose, and a choice he actually made. Knowing full well how a weakened birthing mother was, and still hoping for grandchildren, he had grabbed the boy, thanking Kami that Kashina had fainted after birth, and wasn't there to watch him. Had he stared into her eyes, at that moment, maybe he wouldn't have done it. He would have wanted to do it personally, as the jutsu required would have taken as a toll the life of the user, but Hiruzen had preferred to go there personally and after knocking him out, had done it himself. Minato looked at the statue of the third, carved from a marble block and placed straight in the middle of the square of Konoha, and couldn't help but feel a twinge of guilt, looking at how the statue held a bundle of cloth in his left hand, and his right hand was placed in the tiger symbol, the one generally used for fire jutsus. He remembered when he had gone to the council, after having woken up, with the bundle of clothes and the small child that was Naruto, his whisker marks in his blue eyes. He had sat down at his place in the middle of the council, with on his right the civilian council yelling for blood, with the headmistress of the orphanage Haruno Karusa first line, after having lost her youngest son, and on his left the important clan's heads and the Anbu commander, plus Danzo. I say we must kill the demon, Karusa yelled, her fist landing on the wooden table of the council. Yeah, she's right, was the general consensus of all those who had lost a relative, or a business, in the area of the city where the Kayubi had attacked. This is troublesome, you really want to kill a child? Shikaku Nara muttered. Why should we kill him? Danzo rhetorically questioned. Let's bring him into the Anbu, there he will be trained, and kept under check, afterwards, he'll become a great resource for the council, and the city. He'll become a mindless weapon, you want to say, to be used by who trained him. Hiyashi's white pearly eyes looked straight into Danzo, who, half bandaged, didn't seem to give much of a damn. I say, let's put this to the vote, I've got a dinner to go to. Choza Akamichi, muttered, as he had tried for the past hour to eat something, only to find the stairs of Inoichi Yamanaka and Shikaku Nara to prevent him from doing anything. Fine, Minato finally spoke, those who wished to have the boy killed. His heart cringed inside, but he was a Hokage, he had to do what was best, or the civilians might just as well have him removed. To his relief, only the civilian side raised their hands, barring them thus from the majority of votes. Who wants the child to become a mindless weapon? This time, nobody raised his hands, well, except Danzo and Homura Mitokado, swiftly followed by Kaharu Yudatane, the previous team mates of the Sandame. Why haven't you voted? Minato queried the clan's head, 
in hope for an answer. If I might suggest, why not having the child placed in an orphanage, then, if he shows any aptitude, have him trained in Anbu. He'll get around his peers, and then he can become a weapon, while keeping some of his mind. Hiyashi's suggestion was a middle ground, but still Minato couldn't help but cringe. Anyway, the kid's parents are dead, right? Shikaku queried, it would be a drag to get their permission. Why yes, I took him from the hospital's newborns, from those who would have been sent to the orphanage later on. Minato lied, he had to, he was sure that had he told the truth, that this was his son, he'd end up being taken immediately by Danzo, just to use him as a puppet against him, and, if he wasn't going to, there were always the Iwa ninjas or anyone who'd prefer to try and steal a children of the Hokage from an orphanage rather than from the Hokage's mansion. He also had to admit, that he was doing this for their other child, and for Kashina, she'd certainly kill him, if she knew what he had done to one of their children, without considering what he would have done to himself too, he'd have to lie to her, he did lie to her, out of the twins, one had died. Still, there will be no repercussions on the kid, Minato muttered, he didn't want to use his real name too much, he might get attached, who was he kidding, he already was, he was a father not a lump of rock. And he should be treated as a hero for what he was subjected to, not a demon. The rest was noise in Minato's remembrance, still, he recalled with dread how some shinobis and kunoichis had tried to kill the newborn baby in the crib repeatedly, after he had given the announcement, and thus he had been forced to pass the information that Naruto was the Jinchuriki of the Kayubi on an S-level secret. He went to visit him once a year and he didn't seem in a bad shape, certainly not too bad for being in an orphanage, and he had given the headmistress a monthly allowance to care for the child, and the woman had even said that he was the perfect boy, quiet, who ate little, and who took almost no space at all. Dad can you buy me this? Katsumi's eyes shined brightly, as she pointed at one of the toy Anbu masks that a stall was selling. Minato smiled, well, today was her birthday, it wouldn't be a birthday without one more gift. Returning to the monster, he had finally been left to crawl in the dirt of the back alley, he was covered in grime and filth, but he was already feeling his bones crack back into place, as the wounds had begun closing up. The more he got wounded the more he healed, and the mobs always hit him hard. He was just a monster though, so it was obvious, now he'd have to crawl back to the orphanage, sleep out in the small dumpster behind it, and wait the morning to be brought in, to be thrown in the cold water taken directly from the well, to be splashed at him. That was the drill, his drill. This time, however, it went differently. A girl, no more than fifteen, was carrying back something big and white, rectangular too, with both her hands. She made a small eep sound, seeing him, but Monster said nothing. He simply stood there looking at her, with long brown hair tied in a ponytail and brown eyes, and said nothing, he was half expecting to be beaten, hard, with that strange white thing, which in truth was merely a takeaway ramen carrier, when there were home deliveries to make. Ayame had just finished making the deliveries, when she had taken the back alleyway as a shortcut to get back to her father's ramen stand. That's when she found the beaten boy, who stared at her with really sad eyes. She didn't know what to say, so she simply ran off, she had to get her father's approval first, that she knew. Monster looked at her darting away, leaving him there, and said nothing, his cold gaze slowly faded away as his eyelids closed, his final thought was that, at least, there wasn't so much humidity in that small street. Monster woke up with the sun hitting him on the face, but it took him a while before understanding what was going on. He felt something on his chest, something strange, warm even. Maybe he had been taken to the hospital. He had gone there once, only, to be checked and have his blood taken. There he had to give his full name only that time, Naruto. It was all. He had been tempted of using Monster, even there, but the headmistress had warned him through his beatings that he had to keep feigning being human, even if he was a monster, to the outside world. 
He slowly opened one eye, being very careful of his surroundings. He wasn't in the streets, and he wasn't in the hospital, and certainly he wasn't in the orphanage's bunk beds. He was in a small room, in a pretty blue-colored room. There was a drawer, and a dresser, and a chair and even a desk. He stared at those things without saying a word, not knowing what to do, and actually not knowing what to do in the bed of someone else. He knew that he shouldn't trouble people, because he was a monster. So he silently moved the bed sheets out of the way, and slid down, before putting them back as they were, or at least, as he managed to put them. He cringed inside as he was sure he was still going to get punished for not having placed them perfectly as they were before. Still, that didn't stop him from looking around, that much was certain, but then why was there an orange jumpsuit on the chair, with clean, clean underwear? Was that actually a shirt? Still, was that stuff his to take? What if they accused him of being a thief? It was chilly still, being the morning of October 11th. His birthday had just passed, and now he was five. At least, if five was the number that came after four. He wasn't quite sure about that, but between that and three he preferred the sound of five better. Monster decided to test his luck, and, worst possible case, he'd have to give them back, still, they did steal his clothes from him. Even his dark hue had been replaced with a fair one, did someone wash him? Why would anyone wash a demon? Did he end up in a cultist house? He was going to be sacrificed to some strange god, he knew it. He did his best with the clothing he had, realizing how baggy they actually were didn't matter to him, those were clothes. Downstairs, Tuki was serving ramen to the Hokage's wife, a habitual client. Itadakimas, your ramen is the best Tuki-san. As Kashina smiled, her anbu mask on the back of her head, her green eyes stared at the warm noodle soup with a grin visible on both of them. She happily dug in, as Tuki already readied another pot, as he was pretty damn sure five servings wouldn't have been enough to satiate the hunger for ramen of the Hokage's wife. Next to him, his daughter, Ayame, looked fidgety between Tuki and Kashina, like she wanted to say something, but couldn't. What is it Ayame-chan? Kashina hadn't been in Anbu because she was a dense airhead, the fact she had mistakenly signed for the Anbu Corps instead of the Junins was just a coincidence, a coincidence she'd have to pay for with the three years of obligatory service. Otu-san, Ayame cringed as she spoke the name looking at her father, who sighed and took the ball. We found a kid no more than five yesterday night, Tuki spoke slowly, he had been pretty badly roughed up, but was otherwise fine, if we don't consider the mess his clothes, and his body, was. I see. Where is he now? I might as well bring him to the Uchiha police force to have them question him about who the attacker was, Kashina replied, her mind darkening a bit, who'd hit a five-year-old child. Somehow, half of Konoha's citizen sneezed. He's upstairs, Ayame replied, thank you Kashina-sama. It's Kashina-san for you, Ayame. And Tuki, make another ten bowls of ramen while I'm speaking with the victim upstairs. As Tuki nodded, and sighed seeing how the Anbu redhead had managed to devour with these two pots worthy of ramen, Kashina moved to follow the brown-haired daughter of the ramen stand upstairs of the two-story high house, that had on the front the ramen stand, on the back a bigger kitchen, and the rooms above used by the member of the house. He was still sleeping in my, Kaya. Ayame gasped, as Kashina, with her years worthy of being a ninja, swiftly moved the young girl behind her, and looked around, to see, nothing. There's, nothing, Ayame-chan, she queried, puzzled, but as she saw Ayame enter, she was pretty clear that the reason for the gasp was the lack of the boy in question, as the eyes of the girl were actually looking around, surprised in not finding the boy. I comma I don't know Kashina-sama, he was there, sleeping in the bed. I know, he's still here too, as the only way to exit is through the front door. Kashina made a small smile, as she slowly got down on all fours, and looked with her head under Ayame's bed, her green eyes meeting blue ones. She nearly gasped, as, 
hadn't she brought Katsumi personally to the ninja kinder garden, she'd be damn sure she was under the bed. Plus, that was a boy, and not a girl. He had deeply gushed in cheeks, like one who hasn't eaten much in the last few months. His eyes were blue, but also utterly scared of her, like, really scared. He was completely paralyzed in fear, and Kashina had to think something fast, because it was like watching a rabbit ready to die of fear. Monster was sure this was the end of the line. He knew the mask on the back of the woman's head, it was an Anbu, the headmistress had told him that, if he had been bad, an Anbu would come and make him suffer once and for all. He wouldn't be killed. Monsters do not have that mercy. He would just suffer until he'd beg for death, but then he wouldn't get it. Hey, the woman spoke softly, everything's right, kid. Nobody wants to hurt you anymore. Monster didn't move. This was the first trick, it worked for the headmistress for a while too. She would tell him that everything was fine, and that he wouldn't get hurt. He'd get brought upstairs, and just when he was about to reach the table with the other kids he'd be taken. Hit for some strange reason, and brought back down in the cellar, once it was because of the feet being not perfectly symmetrical, another time because he had given a smile to one of the attendants in the orphanage, once, he remembered, he had just taken a step outside, but the headmistress had told him that it should always be with the left foot, and thus had closed his right foot with the door. He wasn't going to fall for that. Kashina pouted for a moment, that wasn't going to work. Ayame-chan, would you mind bringing one of my ramen bowls up here? Ayame nodded, leaving swiftly. Hey, how about we talk a little then? You must be hungry, right? Monster didn't say a single word, still looking at her with scared eyes. Oh come on, you're not fun. Well, my name is Kashina, you can call me Kashina-san, okay. The wife of the Hokage sighed. There was still no reply from the boy, just what had he been beaten with. Maybe he had some brain damage, and that was why he wasn't replying to her most gentle and soothing tone. So, I told you my name, how about you tell me yours, it's the polite thing to do, you know. Monster cringed. The polite thing to do is to die in a corner, that's what the headmistress said. M. Monster. He stuttered. Kashina raised an eyebrow in surprise. Would you repeat? I'm, Monster. He muttered once more. Nonsense. Nobody has ever been called Monster. D. Demon. Monster tried again. Maybe he had it all wrong from the beginning, and his name was Demon while his surname was Monster. No, Kashina exclaimed, but mentally cursed herself for that, as the boy simply moved further back. He didn't cry however, he simply moved backwards, and his eyes, they were hardened like those of the adults who knew the world was filled with horrors. Ayame entered the room with a bowl in her hand, with the ramen, and a pair of chopsticks. Kashina thanked the girl, and then brought it down on the ground, starting to blow on it in the direction of the scared boy. Monster knew it was the second trick, food. Still, he was hungry, and he was tired of staying tense down there. Maybe he'd manage to get a bite if he was swift enough. Come on, if you come out, I'll give you some ramen. Monster didn't know the name, but still, he slowly crawled out of the bed, but he was still wary about the woman, and the girl. Ayame was it. Well, he was out now, he was sure hits were going to come out any time soon. Maybe as the red-haired woman hands him over the bowl. No, he managed to get it in his hands fine, it was kind of warm. So it was when he tried to drink it. He didn't know what those strange wooden things were after all, so he supposed they were decoration, as trying to chew on them, except making the girl, make a strange sound in her mouth didn't work at all. Kashina couldn't help but stare. In her gaze there was a mixture of amazement, but also anger. The boy didn't even know what chopsticks were. The more he looked at the boy, the more it resembled her own daughter, Katsumi, she couldn't help but feel a tinge of pain in her heart. When she got back home she'd be sure to hug her own daughter well, double time. So, you like it? Kashina asked the boy, 
who looked at her perplexed and hesitant. Warm, he muttered back with a nod. Well, duh, it's ramen. Monster looked at her with a puzzled look. You never had warm food before. Monster shook his head. So, now you feel like you can tell me your name. Monster looked at her with uneasiness. Mo, no. Kashina snapped back. It can't be monster, demon, or anything of the sorts. Your name, what your mother calls you. There, she did it again. The boy started weeping. Monster had no mother. Mother had abandoned him with certainty. He had been brought to the orphanage and left there. Because, as the headmistress had told him, his mother couldn't bear to be with a monster as a children. Ahi, ahi, Kashina hugged the boy, who simply cringed more, I'm sorry okay. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to yell at you. After a moment she managed to actually calm the boy down, patting his head gently. Good, now, how about you thank Ayame-chan for having helped you, and then you come with Kashina-san to find out what happened. Naruto looked puzzled, as he stared for a moment at the girl who had helped him. The silence was embarrassing, actually, but, after a brief moment of hesitation, Monster said. T thank you. It, it was nothing. Ayame replied, with a bit of a smile. Then hop, Kashina said while grabbing the young boy's hand and pulling him back on his feet. Naruto cringed, trying to make himself little. During the trip to the Uchiha compound, especially because some of the stares of the people were on him. Kashina wanted to actually snap out at the people around her, because, being an Anbu, she did have a keen hearing. The murmurs were starting to get on her nerves, and Kami had to help her because she was going to gut the same civilians she should have been protecting. She stopped in front of the Uchiha compound, as a masked nin appeared from thin air straight in front of her. Kashina san. The masked figure wasn't more than 12, maybe 13. Itachi kun, would you mind getting your father Fuguka san for me? Not a problem. The masked nin stared for a brief moment towards the small boy next to the Hokage's wife, but said nothing and disappeared from view. Good. Now, Kashina sama, we're going to be late. Kashina bit her lower lip looking to the group of Anbu that had appeared just then. Listen here, boy, the red-haired woman looked at the four-year-old, you wait till Fuguka-san gets here and you too. Pointing at the two guards in front of the compound, who stiffened, keep an eye out for the kid, and tell Fuguka-san that this boy was attacked last night and he'd better take his eyewitness. Then, when both the guards nodded, she kneeled in front of the boy and said, now you wait for a man to come here, and then you tell him everything that has happened, got it? Monster nodded, he was sure he'd be kicked out the moment she'd be gone, but still, it wouldn't matter much, he did get to put something solid under his teeth. Good, when I come back, I'll meet you at Ichiraku's and you'd better come with your real name around. Monster nodded again, he'd have to find another word as a name, if demon and monster were out. As the red-haired woman left, with four anbus, Naruto waited for the kick. He was sure it was going to arrive sooner or later, but it didn't. In fact, the two guards simply waited, not caring in the slightest. Sure, they wanted to kick him out for being a monster, but they couldn't, especially because it had been the Hokage's wife to bring him there, and, while they did hate the demon boy, they were Uchiha, not complete idiots. Monster waited for a while, before seeing a man simply dash in the street and stopping in front of the Uchiha compound. The Hyuga heiress. They have kidnapped her. There, Monster was sure they'd fault him for that too. The guards outside swiftly entered to warn the others, and, lo and behold, Fuguka-san was the first to have the situation explained by the Hyuga. Monster stood in a corner of the street, waiting, until an explosion far off caught his attention. The Uchiha, and the Hyuga, darted off in that direction. He, on the other hand, waited. Then, finally, the kick came. One of the remaining guards saw the monster waiting out of the compound, and nervous for the reason the boy was there, decided to teach him a lesson. 
Monster would have smiled, if his bones hadn't been so broken, and he hadn't been so miserable, staying there, once more in a dirty back alley. His orange jumpsuit was torn and thrown aside, covered in blood, his blood. The Uchiha had done a number on him, must have made him proud to have so thoroughly punished the demon boy, he was going to make sure everyone knew his prowess in defeating such a monster. Thankfully for the ears of the bar visitors, he never had the chance to, as a kanai passed through his throat, leaving him on the ground, dead. Naruto's vision was blurred, but he did see a masked ninja grabbing him. The headmistress was right once more, the Anbu come for the bad guys, and he was bad, evil, and a demon. One year later, assassinate the target, the message came crisp into his ear, and Monster nodded mentally. He smiled to the elderly granny, who had just finished her talk of how he looked like her grandson, and the next moment, the lady was dead and he was no longer there. Assassination confirmed. The voice came once more in his ear, what did he expect? That he'd fail killing an old woman. Monster, report to Tree. Another voice, more coarse, came through. Tree, here Monster, assassination executed. Mother of the civilian counselor of Odo no Kuni completed. Kanai through the neck with symbols of Iowa assassinated during her stop between villages, the voice came back monotone, without hint of emotion. Good. Go back to root hideout, wait for orders. The hazel-haired boy, with spiked hair, said nothing, it was the first kill he had done, but it had come easy to him. All that waited for him now was to be covered with seals and taken into custody by Danzo-sama as his personal apprentice. He just had to say that it was what he wanted to the Hokage, and then he'd be a full-fledged root nin. He had been given no equipment but a kanai with the Iowa symbol on it, and he was now wearing black cargo pants with a green and brown jacket, his hair had been covered in grime and dirt and had later on been dyed, to make him look someone else. His eyes had been given colored lenses, to make them look brown too, and now he was heading to the hideout of root in Odo no Kuni. He liked Root, he was told his name was Monster, so he had been right on that, and he was told that he would no longer be hit by mobs if he obeyed. He had done so, and no mob had no longer hit him, or thrown things at him. He hadn't walked outside the village for over a year though, and even when leaving the fire country, he had done so through a set of hidden underground passages, so no one would had seen him leave, nor would they see him come back. He was jumping from tree branch to tree branch, when a noise made him stop. Yo, I move like a butterfly and sting like a bee. This is your sensei, killer bee. I don't think using the same word twice counts as a rhyme, sensei. Monster looked downwards, yep, ninjas. The headband marked them as from Kumogakur, apart from a hulking brute with tanned skin, and who was wearing colored shades, there was also a young man with short blonde hair and dark eyes. He was wearing a sleeveless black shirt, the always present forehead protector, black elbow length arm guards, and the red and white kumogakur shin guards. There was also a girl, with blonde long hair tied in a ponytail, who was wearing a black and purple outfit that made it a sore sight in the middle of the green and brown forest. The last one was a dark skinned man with white hair so much that for a moment Monster was starting to think he was an elderly man, just how did you manage to end up with white hair? Did he stress himself out? He had a kind of laid out attitude, though. We're in the land of sound, sensei, we shouldn't be too loud. The young blonde man spoke, as he closed his eyes. If there's anything, I'm sure you'll catch it see. Since it's sensorial that, that, ya see. The guy, killer B, said, as the blonde man pointed to the branch where Monster was. Crap, was all he could say, before a damn, literal, lighting fast second afterwards, he got himself a new set of kanais and shurikens, in his chest. He fell down without as much as a thought, as his consciousness drifted away. See, you hit a child, was the last thing Monster heard, coming from a female and worried voice. Five years later. Naruto woke up, panting from the nightmare he had been in, 
where the mob of people hit him with stones and people wanted him to kill other people, and then he was killed by his friends for being useless. He looked at the clock and sighed in relief. He still had time to get to the academy and get his forehead protector. He dashed downstairs, fist bumping the tanned man that came out of the door on the left of the corridor without much thought, as it was a daily occurrence, the two of them being late. He looked like a mini tornado, as he made his way through the kitchen and out of the door, after giving a quick hand wave to Darui, who was, most lazily, drinking tea with ease. The end of his dash was straight into his class, where a really angry woman stood, in wait, nervously tapping on the floor with her right foot. Yugito Onicha, Naruto would have wanted to say he was sorry, but the chocks flew into his mouth until he had no more space to even speak. Sit Naruto, you're late for the exam. As Naruto spat out the chocks, and the class laughed its ass off, he managed to make his way to the back row, where a written exam was waiting just for him. Naruto swiftly managed to get through the majority of it with ease, thanking Kami that Yugito Onichin was weak to his fabled jutsu, the puppy eyes of doom, and had most kindly told him, just in general and just because she was thinking to herself, some of the general areas where the quiz would have ended up on. As he finished, he gave a wide grin at Yugito, who rolled her eyes over and grabbed the tests from the students. How do you think it went? Did we pass? Is fate going to? Shigenori Yugoro was one of Naruto's friend, the only problem being that he was the fate type of person. Did a rock soar through the sky to hit his head? Fate. Never mind him using fate as an excuse to pick up girls, he stood tall, with raven hair and clear green eyes, and an impeccable white smile. Oh, shut your trap. Fujimoto Shoko muttered without as much as trying to keep her cool. Yugoro had asked her out once, and Shoko had stupidly accepted. The next day, Yugoro had all his face as red as red could become, and Shoko had all but decided to make sure no one ever fell for Yugoro's fate talk ever again. She had her blonde hair tied in a crook, and a pair of thick glasses on her face, which nearly hid her violet eyes. Ladies should be refined. Aikigawa Saya, the epitome of being refined packed into a kimono. How she actually managed to move in a kimono or fight in it was a mystery, but being a genjutsu user, most probably she wouldn't survive in a taijutsu spar. She was the example of what a refined wife would be, with dark hair, brown eyes, little of stature, her skin pale. The only problem was that she packed a worse character than Shoko on her worst days, and Shoko had given a new meaning to worst. Silence in the classroom, Yugito yelled, she had except to be a teacher for this class more for the sake of a fellow Jinchuriki, than because she actually enjoyed being a teacher. Sure, the brats had grown on her, but it didn't matter. She was glad it was going to end with this class. She looked for a brief moment, her gaze softening, when she saw the kid smile and make her a victory gesture. The first time they had met, she was still a student of B, not a Junin sensei, but she was the Jinchuriki of the Nibi, the two tails, Matabi, and had been put under the training of B, who was the Jinchuriki of the Hachibi, the eight tails. I must stress the importance of taking this second part seriously. We will use live weapons for the first time. Naruto feigned dozing off, obviously, if you trained with them at home, or with stupidly idiotical and bulky morons, Naruto grinned in his feigned sleep, then you're pretty much set. Now let's go to the training grounds. Naruto would have sleepwalked till there, had he not been taken by the ear by Yugito herself. Since you think it's easy, then you're going to go first. She snapped at him, as he whined about the unfairness of such a treatment. The moment he reached the throwing area, he grabbed the ten shurikens in one hand, and the ten kanais in the other, and threw all of them without even watching. A set of dull noises later, and all targets had their heads hit, precisely in the eyes. Show off, was the general murmur, as even Saya, for a brief moment, felt compelled to actually act unladylike and tell him a piece of her mind. Jealous. My, 
a fair lady such as yourself should know that fate, a fist in the face later, courtesy of Shoko, it was everyone else turns to show their skills. The final part was the basic display of jutsus, but as Yugito couldn't stress enough, if, by chance, some moronic over-muscled freak idiot had trained them in the use of destructive ones, then, by all means, it was polite to warn the senseis before so that they could avoid destroying a classroom. The three examiners watched Naruto enter with a wide grin on his face, and all three sighed. Fine, what did that dumb idiot teach you this time? The one to speak was a red-haired dark-skinned woman, known as Karui, who perfectly knew and respected Killer B, but still thought of him as an idiot. You'll see, Karui Sensei. After a set of hand symbols, Naruto clapped his hands together while yelling. Futon. Reposho. Wind release. Gale palm. Darui, who was the second sensei for the evaluation, looked unfazed, as the sheets which held the overall results, or had notes on the participants, began flying through the room. Yugito, who was the third and final sensei, looked on the verge of having a nervous breakdown, but managed to grit under her teeth. F fine. You pass. Get the damn forehead protector and get out of here before I tear you to shreds. Darui, no matter how unfazed he looked, threw a Kumo forehead protector at Naruto, who caught it with a smile and started running off, avoiding just narrowly being scratched by Yugito's elongated nails who growled at the agility of the boy, that and the fact that she was being held by Karui, who was shooting accusatory glances at Darui, especially because he wasn't helping at all. Sorry about him. Grilled meat tonight, Darui suggested, once Yugito finally calmed down. That baka will probably prefer ramen at Hakaku's, just to eat and make me fat. Yugito pouted back, earning a chuckle from Karui. What's so funny, flat board? As Yugito muttered that, a large vein started bulging on Karui's forehead. Better flat and thin than having fat on the back side. I do not have a. Darui coughed, sorry for your outbursts. Should we get on with the exams, before the sun sets? Konoha. Minato clenched his fists, and hit the wall of the Hokage's office with strength. He repeated that motion once more, then again, and again, and finally he started doing the same with his head. Hey boy, what's your problem now? The familiar voice of his sensei made him turn around, in surprise. Jiraiya, come in. The toad hermit was standing halfway inside the office, and halfway outside, being in the middle of the window. Nah, I'm fine here boy. The man replied, shrugging as he sat down and took out his notebook, ready to jot down some new ideas for the new book. Ika Ika violence. He felt a nice feeling. It was going to be a success. It is of the utmost importance. As Minato said that, Jiraiya nodded, closing the window behind him, and as Minato activated the privacy seals in the office, he pulled the window's curtains, stopping the light from entering the room. If this is something kinky, my answer is no Minato, you know I'm straight. Jiraiya joked, but suddenly, he felt it, a nervousness and uneasiness he hadn't felt in a while. What's the problem boy? He asked once more, seriously. You were right on Danzo. He no longer had Naruto with him. The voice was sad and riddled with guilt. I told you. So, where did he bring him to train? You don't have to worry. I'll go grab him and make him my apprentice, so he'll be safe and sound. He didn't bring him anywhere. Minato replied, his voice trembling. You can't tell me you believe him. Jiraiya was angry about this. Fooling Minato once pass, but twice. Was Minato losing his senses? I had both Ibiki and Inoichi have a round with him, and while he was a tough nut to crack, he confessed everything, and even dismantled Root for real this time, just to prove his point. He even handed over the scrolls with the missions on looking for Naruto that he had signed his Root Nins, but none were successful. Minato's voice was trembling. I comma I sent my son to die, didn't I, Jiraiya-sensei? Now Minato, 
you don't know how much I'd like to have you pass through a couple of my Rasengans, just to bring the point across that you have been an idiot. You made the life of one of your children the happiest, and condemned the other to misery in the path of a weapon. I'll try and look for him, Minato. I'll try. I won't stop until I'll bring you back a corpse or him. However, have you already told Kashina? Jiraiya felt the uneasiness in Minato, who whispered. I told her over five years ago, when she came back from an Anbu mission and spoke of how there was a blonde kid that looked just like Katsumi, and how he had been mistreated and abused and she actually wanted to adopt him. So you gave him to Danzo? Jiraiya yelled, furious. No, it's just that Naruto didn't come to Ichiraku's like Kashina had thought, and when she went to the Uchiha compound, which at the time had been purged while she was on her mission, she found his jumpsuit covered in blood and no signs of the boy. So she gave him for dead, killed in the crossfire and actually cried for the unnamed boy. You could have told her he was still alive. Jiraiya hissed. I didn't know at the time. Danzo only told me later that he had a prodigal weapon to show me, to face off the enemies of Konoha. Then he started taking time. That's when you came in, but by the time you told me it was Naruto's, Danzo kept lying, telling he was emotionless and would simply work on a kill or be killed basis. By the time you uncovered the truth, that Danzo no longer had him, it was too late to change the news to Kashina, Minato was on the verge of crumbling down, at least, his words carried that much emotion in them. I'll go look for the boy, Minato, what is going to happen to the bastard though? At that question, Minato smirked. Nothing, the council decided he was acting on the benefit of Konoha, so. I'm killing that damn council. One day, just you wait. Is there anything else? The bout of rage came and went swiftly, as the toad hermit queried. No. As Minato shook his head, Jiraiya nodded. Good, then I'll be off, but you will have to tell Kashina. But, Minato tried to refuse. No buts. She's crying for two persons, when in truth they are only one. She had the right to know, and you will tell her or I will. Fine. With that, Minato disengaged the privacy seals, and just as Jiraiya was about to exit, the door swung open, to actually reveal Kashina coming in with Katsumi on her tails. Her long red hair tied into two ponytails, her blonde cerulean eyes and a happy smile, while wearing an orange jumpsuit that made her look like a tomboy. Aero Senen, she exclaimed, waving at Jiraiya who shook his head and left in silence. What was wrong with him? Kashina queried, perplexed as to why the Sanin hadn't replied with his usual I'm not a pervert, but a super pervert. Cameo. Even Katsumi was surprised by that, and she too looked worriedly to Minato, who gulped down nervously. Honey, I need to speak with you alone, please don't hate me. Kumogakur. Ramen. 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 Yugito muttered in her half-asleep state on the couch where B had placed her. In the apartment the Jinchurikis shared there were five rooms, plus a living room that doubled as a kitchen and a relax area, which held the couch that now had the Nibi Jinchuriki on. There was even a karaoke machine by the side, attached to the television. She was the one against it, wanting fish, sushi, and the like, and then, when she wasn't stopping, we had to pry her off the table. C muttered dark in his face as he spoke to Karui who had passed by to see how the lunch had gone, and seeing Yugito in a delirium she naturally had queried on her friend's situation. Yeah, by the way, the rakage wants to see you lot. Naruto shook his head, as he gave the cue to Killer B. Yo ho ho, a meeting we're having, no time for partying, Naruto replied. Brother is waiting, let's keep the heat shaking. Afterwards they bro-fisted each other, giving a set of shivers down everyone, especially Yugito, who just felt good enough to go puke by herself. I'm, leaving, Karui replied, dashing out. I forgot to buy dinner. C muttered, running out behind Karui. Sorry for them, C, I'm coming with you. Darui yelled, dashing behind C. When Yugito actually came out of the bathroom, 
she stared at a horrible scene. Naruto, wearing the Kumo headband protector, with a pair of shades similar to that of B, plus he was wearing a matching outfit with that of B, purple and white. No, was all that Yugito said, before dragging Naruto to his own room, and make him emerge minutes later with a normal and somber ninja outfit, which had a dark brown and dark yellow tint, with black stitching and a pair of long cargo pants, the kanai pouch and a bandolier going from the left shoulder to the right side of his body. There, now off to see the chief. With that, the trio of Jinchurikis headed off to the Rakage's office, the large blue tower in the middle of Kumo. I've got to ask, why weren't there the team assignments? Naruto queried. Kumo's got a large number of military personnel, only Kono, B bit his tongue, hard, as Naruto stopped walking and started shivering. Naruto. Yugito slapped the boy to the side, making him turn around and stare at the elder Jinchuriki with his puppy eyes, it's over, that life of yours is over. Come on, you're a genin of Kumo now, you graduated one year earlier, show your balls. A hi, Naruto meekly replied nodding, as B got a murderous glare from Yugito. Anyway, we're second best, but the team's composition and assignments are given by the Rakage himself after careful consideration and, as B continued, he was cut short by Yugito. Basically, it's a free-for-all. One mission you can end up with me as a Junin commander, another one with Darui, and even your teammates may vary. This helps strengthen us by forming friends and by knowing the strengths and weakness of our fellow ninjas. As Yugito finished explaining the various degrees of missions available and how no, no genin would ever be sent on an assassination of a high-priority target, they finally got into the Rakage's office, without knocking. A's fist shot forward, grabbing B in his famous iron claw punishment method. Gah, bro, what is this for? B protested. You taught the kiddo another destruction jutsu. You damn idiot. Teach him something useful once in a while. As a finished his rant on the stupidity of teaching a young boy high-level destruction techniques, Naruto simply jumped and grabbed a hold of the Rakage's neck. T.O.U. San. I did it. Somewhere, in Konoha, a really beaten up blonde haired man shivered deeply. Very, very deeply. Flashback. When Monster had come to his senses, after the hits taken by the Kanais and the Shurikens, he had realized he was still alive. Somewhere, a part of him was regretting that. Somewhere else, he knew that this simply meant he was alive to take another beating. He slowly opened one eye, not even much, just a little, that a voice, the same voice of the man that had given him out, came into his ears. The kid woke up. He wanted to refuse waking up actually, to tell him he was wrong, and that he could feign sleeping, or a near-death comatose state, pretty well, he had a lot of practice on those. Still, Monster knew he had no choice, but to slowly open both eyes, and then nearly let out a scream, nearly, because the muscle-bound freak had swiftly placed a hand on his mouth, hushing him into silence. Oh hell, he knew what this was, he knew it, he didn't want to, and he had gotten lucky till then, but now he knew it, that big bad horrible man was going to. You hungry? Offer him food. Well, Monster knew it was either that or an innuendo of something that made him cringe inside. Still, he thought it would be polite not to comment on the fact, and wait until the man realized he was keeping his primary oxygen resource closed, thankfully Danzo-sama had trained him pretty well with torture. Heck, he had even congratulated him on surviving so long on being literally burned alive by scorching hot irons. He didn't mention the years of practice to actually achieve said goal, even before entering the root training program, unwanted practice no doubt. B sensei, if you don't remove your hand you might suffocate him. The dark-skinned white-haired man commented, which got him first a surprised look from B, then a swift removal of the hand. Monster could finally breathe in air again, finally. Sorry for B sensei, kid. As the white-haired man said that, a small tick appeared on Monster's forehead. Well kiddo, you won't warn your family we're trespassing in the land of sound, right? 
As the hulking macho finished talking, another figure, more graceful, moved closer to him and looked at him with a sympathetic smile. Monster nodded. He wasn't actually lying. Danzo Sama wasn't his family, he didn't need something that weak. He no longer had any sadness or ill sentiment towards this thing called family that others had and he hadn't, as many root operative didn't have a family and were strong. Danzo Sama had told him that family made one weak, and that only obeying was strength, that, and becoming a perfect weapon. He had particularly stressed the importance for him to learn how to use a strange red chakra, which he managed to get when his emotions rampaged out of control, into a more stable form. He had gotten angry once when he had been deemed a failure in the Bunshin technique, and had been called worthless. Since he was monster, and he had to become the perfect weapon, being called worthless made him angry, really angry. He should have called him monster, it was his name, Danzo Sama had decided that, and that was final. He was not called worthless. Danzo Sama had calmed him after he had killed the sensei, who Danzo Sama had then deemed weak for having failed. That was when he had been patted on the head by Danzo Sama, and that was a really fond memory he wouldn't forget, ever, as Danzo Sama has said that he was monster, and that he was going to be the perfect weapon without fail. Why did you have a radio set? The sensor guy queried once more, and Monster cocked his head slightly to the side. Was he referring to the talky-talky thing? Push the button and talk only when they talk to you first. He had been trained not to mind, equipment either worked or did not, latter of which it wasn't meant to work in the first place and it was a test to see who was worthless and who was to become the perfect weapon. He doesn't seem to be the speaking type, B sensei, we could give him breakfast and then send him on his way. As the blonde-haired Kunoichi suggested that, C shook his head. He was jumping from tree branch to tree branch, and faint as it was, there was the smell of blood on the kid. The tick mark on monster grew bigger. He's just a kid, C. The white-haired guy commented. Darui, he's not a kid. The C guy was starting to be his favorite now, still the tick mark of nervousness stood there. Yeah, and what is he, a sonin? Yugito took that moment to make some sarcasm, but, too bad for her, Monster looked at her perplexed. What is a sonin? He asked, interested. Was it better than Monster, like perfect weapon? Or was it like worthless? You don't know. It's the term used to define the legendary trio from Kono. B had barely said the last letter that Monster had already charged him with his right fist, flying in a blind rage. B had parried the fist with ease, but the gaki had then somersaulted using the fist as a focal movement, cracking his own damn wrist in an effort to throw a kneecap on the back of the muscle macho. When he was blocked in his attempt by Darui, the first to actually intervene, blocking him with his right arm, he could feel both him being pulled backwards, but also the boy's very own bones break. What is, going on, Yugito couldn't reply, as B, taking the offense, gave the boy a quick punch in the stomach, sending him to the land of dreams. Did you see that? C muttered. One moment he's all what is a sonin. Yugito muttered, the other he charges through like a beast. What could that be? Mental conditioning, Darui muttered, whatever it is, it has to do with the word Konoha. As soon as he said that, he actually assumed a defensive position, because the boy, no matter the hit from B, actually twitched at the word. It seems to have an effect even when fainted. Just who'd do such a thing? And why? C whispered getting closer to the boy, who now, thanks to B's punch, certainly needed to have his ribs checked. What do we do with him? Yugito queried. Well, we carried a gaki till here and we'll carry him till there. And if he won't wake up here, and he won't wake up there. Then we'll wrap a song and wake him up in Kumogakur. As B finished rapping, he saw the gaze of his students, already full-fledged chunins, all disapprove. I don't care, we're doing this, especially because he felt the chakra of a tailed beast, as the Hachibi had told him, but that, B kept to his own thoughts. Should I heal him? C queried, but B shook his head. 
Not now. First we get away from the land of sound. Then we can take our time. Your healing jutsus are still a bit rusty. And I don't want you accidentally killing him, you know. Plus, with a broken wrist there are less chances he tries something. Splint his arm and hand, so he doesn't move the bone wrong, but let's leave him nice and unconscious for a while. Hi, B sensei. It was a little bit after the third night, that monster actually came back to his senses. It was actually a miracle he hadn't died, depending on which version you'd listen to the story. On one side, Yugito said that the boy should have already been dead, with broken ribs puncturing lungs and the like, and that not happening was just a sign of Kami that the boy would lose all his luck. B on the other hand commented that throwing a boy high in the sky and running over a mountain's wall to grab him and jump downwards the other side was perfectly normal, healthy, and reinforced the spirit. When Monster actually woke up, he was at a camp, deep within a set of mountains, his right hand seemed stiff, and, staring at his, he realized it had been splinted pretty well, by expert hands too. Much better than what he usually did to his own broken bones, as he had self-taught himself, like any other kid in route, the means of first aid. Where, he queried with a puzzled look, the question hang in his mouth for a moment, as he was indeed surprised of the scenery. All he saw were mountains, rocks, and more mountains. Was it Iowa? No, it should be Kumo, as memories of the last events entered his brain, he recalled the Kumo ninjas, unless they had been feigning being from Kumo, in which case he'd be anywhere with mountains, even the land of earth could do, and that would actually mean Iowa. Or maybe they were rogue ninjas who had kidnapped him, and were planning on exchanging him back to Konoha with information or jutsus. He had to do what Danzo Sama had instructed him to do. Still, he had spoken first instead of thinking, so now they knew he was awake, the sensor ninja certainly would have already said it, but looking around, Monster realized he was alone with the blonde girl, who was pouting and cursing by the fire of the camp, and hadn't even heard him ask the question. That was his chance. He slowly began to crawl away, careful not to make even the slightest pebble move under the weight of his feet, as he took small steady breaths to ignore the sharp pain in his stomach. He thanked his regenerative powers that he was still alive, but still, he had to make it down that damn mountain and back to Danzo-sama. He had to become the perfect weapon for Danzo-sama, so he would help him stop being hit by the people in the village. That's when his right foot barely misplaced a small rock pebble. He froze on the spot. He should think about escaping, not about his future. He wasn't going to be captured alive. Danzo-sama had told him to run, and if he was being hunted closely, to kill himself. He turned around, and silently thanked Kami that a monster like him had managed to get that far from the fire pit, only to turn around and let out a scream, as Yugito's face was mere inches away from his, and she was grinning. Going somewhere, kid, she said in a teasing tone, but before she could finish and grab him, monster had already thrown himself to the side, to the side of the mountain, to the ravine below, to a deadly fall of over a thousand meters. Yugito cursed Kami, on the other hand, and began running downwards, while using explosive tags to make a side of the mountain crumple and scatter the rock pieces far from the mountain's side, so that she could run on top of them, grab the kid, and then run back on them with unhuman agility to the mountain's side, holding the kid by the neck. ANF, no more than five years old, and with a death wish already. As she slowly made her way back up, she was pretty sure, a certainty that became manifest when B Sensei, Darui and C Shunshin back to camp, that she had made enough noise to attract any ninja in a kilometer's good radius. We move camp, you explain later, I hold the kid, B ordered, as the camp was quickly dismantled, and the muscle bound freak grabbed the boy, monster didn't protest, the man was stronger than him, and he was being held with a strength enough to bend his ribs, if he just applied a little bit more of force, he might just as swell snap him in two. The camp moving had been a quick event. They had barely set up camp once more, this time in a narrow cave, 
where Monster was brought down from the tan man's shoulder and on eye level with him. You have eaten nothing for three days straight, nor drank, and yet you make all this noise. What are you, a real Sanin? As B queried that, Monster looked at him with a puzzled look, again with that question. I'm Monster, he replied, with a bit of pride. Monster, that's your nickname. Are you an academy trainee of Odo? B queried, puzzled. No, Monster is Monster. Monster replied matter of fact, again with this stuff of the nicknames, it was getting old. So, who trained you? B asked. Monster can't say. He promised not to, or he becomes worthless, and worthless gets killed. Worthless always gets killed. Monster hoped it was enough to let him go back to Danzo-sama. Well, what's your name then? I'm B, and I am the best rapper of Kumo, which earned him a set of rollover eyes from his students, that one over there is Darui-kun, then we have our sonar radar ninja Si-kun, and finally we have our good little yugido chan Monster thought about this, it had already happened once, didn't it? Someone asking him his name, he hadn't even come up for an answer. It had been an entire year. Monster, he replied sure of him. No, that's a nickname, a name is something like, A, D, J, X, B tried. Samui, Darui, Karui, Darui actually suggested his own name. Yoko, Saya, or the likes, those are names. Yugito pointed out, not Monster. Monster nodded for a minute, then said. Demon, what he got in reply was a perplexed look. Repeat that, C queried, B was actually pretty much sure his hunch was proving right, as the Hachibi was telling him the same stuff. Demon, monster, fox demon, trash, I was called monster though, most of the time, so I thought it was my N, Yugito actually clung to him after a brief moment of hesitation, hugging him. Monster didn't know how to react to this, was it a hold? A wrestling move? Was it a bone breaker taijutsu? Was she taking a kunai out of her sleeve and stabbing him on the back? He didn't know what to do, so he did nothing, staying in wait, frozen, a fact which did wasn't missed by the other kumo ninjas, who simply saw the boy stiffen and his eyes grew cold and worried. Hmm, would you mind lifting up your shirt, monster kun? B asked the question trying his best not to rap, which came really difficult to him, only to be shot down by Yugito's hardened glare. Hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. What did they call you except that? Hospital bills. What name did they tell you to use in the hospitals? Releasing the boy from the hug, but keeping her hands on the boy's shoulders, and getting on her knees to see into his eyes, Yugito hoped the boy actually went to a hospital. Once, he wasn't more than six years old, surely at least for the blood check, or if he ever got sick. No, she was sure that if he had been sick they'd have left him sick. She just knew how some people reacted to Jinchurikis, and it wasn't at all how it was in Kumo, at least, sure, the Hachibi had gone mad a couple of time, but there was more respect for them than scorn, in the end both side knew it wasn't anyone's fault, lest of all the Jinchurikis, and so it simply came down to personal feelings, more than outright ignorance. The headmistress said to me that, when I was meeting the Hokage or I was in the hospital, I should be called Naruto, because I was a worthless ramen topping to be discarded, that she said. Monster simply nodded in recollection of the words of the headmistress, yet why was the young woman sobbing? Did he do something wrong now? A ninja should steal its emotions. B stated, more like a whisper, to Yugito, who took a moment to recollect her thoughts, and calm Matabi down from going on a rampage against those who'd, her words, dare harm such a cute little innocent boy I'd just snatch away to cuddle in a corner, before saying with a small smile. The worst she had been called was fur ball, and even then, that was more of a tease than an actual insult. Then your name is Naruto, but not because you are discarded as a ramen topping, they are actually quite good to eat, you got that, Naruto-kun. As Yugito smiled at him, Monster didn't understand it, yet, but he had just been named once more. Still, 
he felt a strange warm sensation in the back of his stomach, as he kept up a frowning and not understanding face. End of flashback. Otu-san. Otu-san. Naruto was happily chuckling as he held the neck of his adoptive father with a wide grin, obviously, had a wanted to. He'd throw the boy out of the window with less than a second of thought, but the boy would probably just climb back up, and do that again. So he simply decided to keep the boy on his back, it was still exercise, of some sorts. Well then, I've got you lot of nice easy work as a first mission, you already. Naruto raised an eyebrow. Wait, Otu-san, does that mean, as Yugito smiled at the thought of actually being with her practically adopted little brother, she actually had a frown on her face seconds later, just as B instead simply started the set of complicated hand motions that he and Naruto had practiced on for when they had to clap their hands for important stuff. Rakage sama isn't it risky to send us all out at once, in the same group? As Yugito asked that, the Rakage smiled for a moment. It would need a lot of fools to even think to defeat a trio like yours, plus, I did think I told Karui to go grab C, he'll act as your medic nin and censor. Otu-san, why are you sending out three junins with a genin? Naruto was happy, really, he was, but he kind of wondered why he'd get preferential treatment, at least that was his thought, and he didn't want that, he wanted to be treated like the other kids. You have yet to master control of the Kyubi chakra, Naruto, since it's considered to be far more powerful than that of the Nibi or the Hachibi, if you go mad while training it would be best to have two other Jinchuriki nearby to calm you, and a medic nin to heal any wounds. The Rakage had slowly gotten on his knees, smiling at the boy. Otu-san, Naruto looked with pleading eyes at A, who rolled his eyes over. That's final. Anyway, you've got a C rank mission straight from the beginning, so no whining. Your mission is going to be in the land of waves, which is far and near, he stopped for a moment seeing both Yugito and B gasp, that other hidden village. You have been given permission papers, so all you actually need to do is just to show up at this point, on the map, which I'm giving to the most trustworthy of you. As he said that, folding a map in a scroll, he went to hand it over to Yugito, who was smiling, until the scroll passed over her to C, who had just arrived. She frowned and B and Naruto chuckled at that. You should protect the bridge builder Tazuna-san from harm, he's going to be in that village for supplies, and then he's going to meet you on the road, since we won't be escorting him from the beginning. He only pays us for a demission, which is perfect for Naruto-kun here. Then, his tone darkened. Since it will take you a month to get over there, you'd better stock up on supplies, and while you're at it, start training the Gaki. Once you get out of the Land of Lightning, I don't want to have to rebuild an entire apartment complex, because someone forgot to keep his chakra levels low. As I said that, he looked at both Yugito and B while Naruto whistled and sea sweat dropped. Furthermore, if any ninja from that village try anything funny, I want you to point out that this blonde-haired brat is my son. You got that bro, keep an eye out for your nephew. As I said that, B grinned when the two bro fisted, sending small sonic waves around, as Naruto raised an eyebrow, but, as with the things he didn't understand, decided not to question his Otu-san. Now. Naruto, go and get ready while I finish speaking with the rest of your teammates. The boy nodded, hugging one last time a before departing as swiftly as he had arrived. Turning his serious rakage face on, he said, I know your complaints, but he needs to get used to hearing that word and seeing that headband, the fact that right now there are no trades, nor words of alliance are not between us and Konoha doesn't mean that in the future it will still be like that there is a distension policy in action, so keep your cool. As I pointed that out, B was about to wrap something, before getting iron clawed to the ground, again. Anyway, Tazuna might or might have not hired some Konoha nins too, so you've got a month to get the boy calm and nice with the idea of being together with other ninjas. In any case, keep in mind that Izakumo Shinobi, 
he was one from the moment he walked through that door and told me he wanted to stay here and from the moment I adopted him, if anyone tries something funny to him, then have no mercy and bring him back. Got it. The three nodded. Good. Now you're dismissed. As they all shunchened away, the rakage turned back to his desk, letting a memory wash over him. Flashback. The door had opened with a loud bang, as always, and as always it was ready to iron claw his brother, only to stop midway, when he saw that B was carrying a brat no more than six years old on his shoulder. He stopped because of the eyes, the eyes that stared at him and had a mixture of sadness yes, but understanding, it was like the boy expected him to be the target of the iron claw, and as such, a had simply stopped. He couldn't do it with those eyes looking straight at him. Bro. B had already prepared himself to being hit, and realizing he wasn't, he had actually been worried that maybe a had been sick or something. Can't hit you with a brat on the shoulder, a replied, where did you get him? Well bro, we were going through Oto. Dashing through the Oto Nins. We did the mission in Toto. And we tried to leave and he comes in. Jumping branch to branch, he stops and C gives the sign. So when the Kanais get Lon, a had most silently grabbed the boy, had given him over to Yugito, and had them iron clawed B twice. Without rapping, as a finished muttering curses, his brother had gotten back up, and had replied. Well we wounded him by mistake, and since we thought he was a civilian kid we brought him with us, then turns out he's a pack package, you know. Touching his own stomach, B winked at his brother, who looked surprised. A jinchuriki, yeah, and he doesn't know that, but he wasn't from Oto, or they'd keep him tight, so I heard his soul and felt his plight and, as B was actually starting to rap again, A ignored him, and looked over Darui. Explain, while massaging his temples. He was probably conditioned mentally, when a specific word is heard, Yugito looked at Darui, with a murderous glare, which made the white-haired teen roll his eyes over and continue. He gets homicidal, really a lot, with no care for himself, he actually goes as far as breaking his own bones if he needs to. So basically it's one mess of a jinchuriki. Naruto. The boy replied nodding. What? The rakage queried. Not jinchuriki, my name is Naruto. First it was monster, then demon, then monster, then perfect weapon, then kid, then brat, then Naruto. She named me Naruto. As the boy said that, he pointed without bias or anything at Yugito, who looked down at the brown spiked boy with a slight blush. I don't think he's been trained in controlling his biju chakra, and we suspect he might be, Yugito started, but didn't finish, because B interrupted her. Well, bro, he said he's the demon fox, so that leaves us with, B was interrupted by the rakage. The Kayubi, the Nine Tails. A stared at the boy, the weak, frail boy who seemed he could use some meat on his bones, and who was looking at him like expecting something. A moved his right hand, and the boy actually made the imperceptible movement of bringing his cheek forward, like he was expecting to be hit, and he wanted to make it, easier. Well, it seems that damn spiky blonde idiot. Someone in Konoha, five years before, sneezed. Actually didn't kill the beast as he had the news go around, kid, when were you born? Naruto stared at the man, trying to think, this didn't actually pertaining a question Danzo-sama had told him not to answer, so he answered. 10 of October, is my name kid now? He asked slowly. No, it's still Naruto. Yugito snapped in, before the rakage could reply. It is, and will always be Naruto. Kid is, a nickname. Nickname? What's a nickname? Naruto queried. Well, I'm Yugito Ni, it's my name and surname, my nickname is Cat, it's what my friends call me. Friends? Naruto queried once more. The general silence in the area was more than enough, for the moment, as a coughed. Well so the date the Kayubi attacked Konoha is, at that moment, a raised his right hand, as Naruto had all but dashed, furiously to body slam against the rakage, jumping straight against him right hand in a fist, ready to hit him in the face. Bro, 
B actually managed to grab Naruto's leg and pulled him away just in time for it to not punch him in the stomach, B's punches and A's punches were different stuff altogether, and the rakages one would have probably left the boy in the hospital for weeks. So it's the word of that village huh? Suspected as much, the rakage muttered looking at the boy that was being held by B, and who didn't even seem to consider himself, going as far as having his clothes torn if necessary, just to get onto him, even dislocating his own shoulders, it had to hurt, but to the kid it didn't even seem to matter at all. No sense of preservation, what bastard could do this to a kid? I like his balls though, a muttered, fine, first we take care of him, some food, a checkup in the hospital, then I want someone to keep an eye on him and get him, well, I don't say normal, but bearable. As he rolled his eyes over, Darui gave a quick hand chop to Naruto's neck, sending him to faint on the ground, only for Yugito to actually grab him and give her teammate a scornful stare. Well, Cat here can take care of the boy. You lot, I expect a written report on my desk by tomorrow, dismissed. As a turned his back on the desk, he waited until his brother's team was gone, to stare out of the window of his office, into the view of Kumogakur. Those eyes, he muttered simply, getting back to the workload on his desk. Flashback end, Kumo front gate. So, first we go through Shimo no Kuni, then through Yu no Kuni, and then we go through Hai no Kuni for a while, till the meeting point, no reaction from Naruto made everyone happy, and finally we reach Nami no Kuni. Got that down, as C asked that, holding the map, he received nods from everyone. Yes, when are we going to train C-san? Naruto-kun, this is our first mission, as a team, I say B-san can be the sensei, alright? As Yugito suggested that, the boy nodded. Fine by me. So, Naruto smiled and turned to B, when are we going to train B-sensei? Yo, let's get some distance between us and the city, you heard the boss. Then later we make camp and I'll teach ya. As B signaled them to start moving, they dashed off. Konoha, Kashina Haim, please, let me explain. Minato was on his knees on a bag of beans, looking miserable in front of his wife, who had kept slapping at him for a good part of the day, and, after coming home, in the Namikaze estate, she had thrown him to sleep on the couch, and had refused speaking to him at all. As she was cooking dinner, every chop she made cut deeper into the wooden surface of the table, finally, she grabbed the knife and exasperated, launched it against the head of Minato, who moved his head to the left, avoiding it by the length of a hair. Our Katsumi-chan is going to come back any moment now, from the academy. She's going to smile and tell us everything is fine and speak about fashion and boys. Meanwhile, somewhere, there's a young boy who is just like her but is scared, probably hungry, and left alone in the woods, left to die as a weapon for that bastard Danzo. And all of this is happening because his father chose to let him suffer alone. Kashina looked at the fourth Hokage with a saddened expression, and then went back to preparing dinner. Minato knew he had little excuses, but it had to be done, he was in the right with his decision. What then? he would still have ended up as a weapon for Danzo, to be used by him to bring me down of my position as fourth, and then Katsumi-chan would have had to leave with the social stigma of having a Jinchuriki as a brother. She would have hated her brother for her sufferings, and you would. Don't speak for me, Kashina exclaimed back, I cried tears of pain when you told me he died at birth, and I cried tears of joy when you told me he hadn't, and then when I went and didn't find him there, I cried again at having lost him once more. You kept him hidden for another year from my arms, and I couldn't even see him once as he grew up. The red-haired woman's eyes turned watery, as she shook her head. If Jiraiya-sama finds him, and pray for Kami he does, I want you to recognize him as my son. I don't care about Danzo, I can snap his neck if he even says a word. I want my son back, Minato. Give him back to me, his mother, and maybe, if he does, I'll forgive you too. As she finished speaking, 
Kashina stared down at the food she should have been preparing. Well, she had placed the salt with the sugar and had mixed the custard with the mayo, and had then chopped a raw piece of meat in the middle of an onigiri, an onigiri which was moving across the table. She sighed, shaking her head. I can't cook tonight, she muttered. I could order ramen takeaway. Minato suggested getting up, as Kashina stared at him angrily, when they both heard the door open, and a female voice yell from the hallway. Ka san, Otu san, I'm back. Kashina's face was a mixture of nervousness and sadness. She didn't know wherever to tell her daughter that she had a brother whom her father sent to die. She shook her head, letting her red hair move slowly on her shoulder. She'd tell her after her genin exams, next year. Still, she couldn't fathom staying too close to her, the wound still fresh in her heart, and as she looked towards Minato, she silently lip spoke. I want a mission out of Konoha. Land of snow days later. The groups of Kumo ninja were walking on a snow-covered hill in the land of frost, which was positioned nearby a small meadow, with, at a slight distance, a cold stream of frozen water, and a cave. Killer B was the first of the line, with C behind and Darui in the back, his hands in his pocket and grinning at the sight Naruto walking with his weight, and Yugito next to him, watching with a small grin the young genin work. So, I get it, I've got wind affinity. Yes, I need chakra control. Still, why are walking into this damn cold and kami be damn country and I'm the only one with weights? As Naruto exclaimed that, he was carrying on his back a large iron pot, whom he had no idea where C had taken it out from. The exercise was pretty simple. He'd have to send enough chakra to remain on the snow, and not too much to actually crush it and send him knee-deep in the cold white stuff. Yo kiddo, this is training. You heard da boss. B replied, rapping, Sikun is everything all right near us. Sensei, there's nothing around us for miles, C muttered, having sensed nothing. We make camp then, Naruto, go and fill the kettle with snow, then we'll have Yugito chan turn it to water, and we'll have instant ramen. The food of champions, yo. All right, Naruto actually dashed, reaching for the frozen river with the iron pot, eager to get some food into his stomach. Ramen, B sensei, ramen isn't good every day as breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Yugito muttered, sensei, I say we can start training him some jutsu, just look at him running back. Darui said, pointing out how, even with the thin ice, Naruto had actually managed to reach a broken area of the ice, where it was, by nature, thinner and after having filled it with the water, was already making his way back, without falling in the snow. Yugito rolled her eyes, sighing, for ramen he'd learn S rank prohibited jutsus in a day. When Naruto got back, he grinned looking at the group of Kumo ninja, as he slowly placed the pot down, he saw B throw him a scroll. Look kiddo, you know I'd love to help you, but no one here has got wind affinity, so you're on your own with that scroll there, should teach you a jutsu called futon, datapa. Wind release. Great breakthrough now, what we can do is train you until you get going with lightning affinity. So, first off, focus chakra on the tip of your right index. As B showed him his right hand's index, which started glowing a bright blue hue, Naruto tried doing the same, obtaining a fading and shaking blue color and looked at B in wait for the next step, as he did, however, he lost control and the chakra dissipated. Well, once you got that down, you start making your chakra vibrate, until it starts to spark, as B said that, the blue hue started becoming brighter and brighter, until sparks of electricity began to dance along all the length of the finger. Once you do this with both hands, as B said that, both his hands started sparkling with electricity, you can release the Raiden, Jaibashi. Electromagnetic murder, as B touched the ground, the sparks moved a little, before dying out. The more chakra you put in it, the stronger it becomes. It can go from shocking to outright killing boy, so be careful on that. Which brings up the jutsu I am going to teach you, Raiden, 
Kangekiha, wave of inspiration. As Darui did a couple of hand signs, he then showed his hands glowing brightly with electricity, that he discharged on the iron pot, sending the water inside to jump outside and fall on Naruto, who had been pretty much warm and cozy and not drenched till seconds before. Yugito looked at the scene, raising a twitching eyebrow, while Naruto started shivering and batting his teeth. Good Kami, I've been banded together with idiots. With a set of quick signs, a flame wave emerged from Yugito's mouth, hitting the pot and what water remained inside, while Naruto had moved closer to the flame, to dry himself off. Yugito kept it going for just a couple of minutes more, and then finished the technique. Thanks Yugito Onichin. Naruto smiled at the blonde woman, who sighed. What would you lot do without me? She grinned slightly at the thought. Anyway, when you train with lightning, know that the moment it leaves your body it becomes slower, as wind affinity is actually strong against lightning affinity because it's a natural insulated material. As B finished explaining, Naruto nodded then sat down next to the pot, and began concentrating, keeping his eyes fixed on his right finger. He'd make it work, he was sure of it. Darui and B went to scout ahead, while C remained in his sensor mode and Yugito actually growled, as they had silently made her the instant ramen cook. She had just barely grabbed the powdered ramen from her backpack, that a spark caught her attention, as it caught that of C, who, being the sensor, was actually seeing Naruto's coil concentrate their chakra to his right hand extremity. Another spark, then another, then his hand began sparkling with raw current, as Yugito stared in silence at such an impossible feat, in less than an hour. That was impossible. Naruto was concentrating, hard. He didn't want B to think he was weak and couldn't do it. He didn't want C to think he was weak, nor Darui, or Yugito. He wanted to show them he was a full-fledged ninja of Kumo, as he wanted to show he was going to be able to do it. He felt his hand going slightly numb, as he poured as much chakra as possible in it, feeling the sparks increase in number, until, in the end, he opened his eyes to be greeted with a slightly glowing hand, with small sparks of electricity flying across his palm. Well done, Naruto-kun, I'm impressed. Yugito muttered, looking at the boy's eyes suddenly lighting up in glee, and making such a beautiful smile, she couldn't help but slightly grin too. She would have hugged him, following Nibi's suggestion if only her hair hadn't been perking up from her sides, a clear sign that there was a lot of static electricity in the air. Naruto, you should discharge that, C said, pointing at Naruto's hand. The blonde spiked kid nodded, moving a bit away from camp, heading towards the meadow. He actually flooded the entire area with his chakra, would you believe it? C was puzzled. It was a strange sign even for Yugito. Well, it happens in the beginning, to miscalculate the amount. Yugito replied, getting back to the instant ramen. You don't get it. The entire area, till that river over there. C pointed at the stream, is slightly filled with his chakra. He's got enormous reserves, not counting his tenant, I even have to concentrate to see through it, and let me tell you it's not an easy task. With that, Yugito simply nodded and went back to making sure the water didn't freeze while the ramen cooked. The coast is clear, sorry we're late. Darui replied a couple of minutes later. Yo, where's the kid? B queried. He's not with you. Yugito dreaded the reply of B. No, sorry, Darui replied, shaking his head. Calm down, it's not like there is anything here that wants him dead, he's going to be fine. C replied, as he did, however, he started scanning the area as much as he could. Fortress of the Snow Daimyo, prisons. The floor was cold, dirty, and with pieces of wet and cold hay scattered around. The walls were gray and cold to the touch, as anything else in there was too. He would have been angry. He should have been angry. The truth was however that he felt more embarrassment than anything else at the moment. He had discharged his hand against a tree bark, earning himself a slight shock too, and as his hand has gone a bit numb with the electricity, 
he had decided he could take a quick relief trip behind a bush. Said bush had swiftly provided to knock the wind out of him before he could even react, worst of all, when he had his pants down. When he had woken up, he was both glad and saddened. Glad, because there wasn't a really pissed Yugito who had warned him time and time again to double check his surroundings before doing anything, even yawn, and saddened, because he was in a prison cell, with a strange mechanical device that seemed to enjoy staying tightly attached to his right arm. Furthermore, he felt his legs hurt. It had been a while since he had last felt his leg actually hurt, as he could take normal pain levels easily, and only higher degrees of pain could actually make him wince, or outright cry, and, as he gave them a quick glance, and then averted his sight, he bitterly thought about how, maybe, broken legs wouldn't be that easily repaired in a night by the Kyubi's chakra. He knew of the Kyubi, inside of him, since he had been seven years old, and had trained with B to at the very least not go into a rampage. He had never spoken to the demon, the seal on his body was still too strong for that, and, maybe, it was luck that he hadn't turned a mad jabbering mess. The seal was the handy work of the fourth Hokage, he had been told that, he knew it, he knew who was to blame for all of his sufferance and pain, and he kind of wanted him to suffer the same way he had, but then he shook his head, biting his lower lip removing the dark thoughts of inescapable tortures and darkness. This time it was going to go differently, yes, this time there was someone who was caring for him, and they'd come and save him, they'd come and rescue him from where he was, certainly, they wouldn't deliver him straight into the hands of the enemy, and then leave without even considering what was going to happen to him. That red-haired woman, Kashina, was it. She still haunted his dreams at night, and he never had pleasant dreams, not most of the time. He had lost count of the time he had woken up startled by something he had seen, or felt, his dreams were so damn real he could swear they still hurt. Right now, however, he had to keep his mind busy with happy thoughts, or he'd crack. He would have laughed at the irony of using the root procedure to resist torture, when they had been the prime source of the torture itself, and were now going to save his ass from being tortured. He'd die rather than reveal anything on Kumo, or on B or Yugido, or C, or Darui, or Otu-san, or anyone else. Within the next hour, thoughts of how any moment now the Hachibi form of B would break up the wall and free him came into his mind, as he realized he no longer had much of his clothing on, and cold was cold. He felt from a high above small window, riddled with iron bars, a hellishly freezing wind, that just seemed to enjoy coming around him. He looked at his arm, where they had placed the strange mechanical device, and only then, when he tried to pamper with it some more, he heard a voice. I wouldn't do it. It might just as well explode. The reply came from a female voice, which sounded prideful and haughty. As Naruto moved his head slightly to the side he looked surprised, there was a girl there. Dressed in strange clothing, of blue and red, but she did look having been a bit roughed around the edges. So, who are you? The question, quite actually, was posed by both the individuals at the same time. I'm Naruto, the boy replied, with a nod. I'm Yukie, you don't know who I am, right? She queried, actually surprised the boy hadn't tried to get an autograph from her. Should I, at first, Naruto tried to recall the bingo book, but shook that dreaded thought out of his head, no, bad Naruto, no remembering things you don't want to remember, then, seeing how he couldn't he simply shrugged the thought off. You ever watched a movie? The girl queried him once more. No, Naruto actually replied, I'm not much on televisions or films, why am I here? If you don't know, what makes you think I know? Yukie rolled her eyes in a scornful way, muttering something about idiots. So, why are you here? Naruto asked once more, giving the girl an analytical look, she didn't seem to have the same thing he had on his arm. None of your business, she replied, hastily turning around and outright ignoring him. Hey, you could try and be a little gentler to a fellow prisoner. 
Naruto replied, staring at the bars, and then, realizing he actually hadn't been tied up, strange, he grinned. I'm getting us out of here. Then he crawled, ignoring the pain that was being shot towards his brain by his broken limbs. He tried to concentrate chakra on the palm of his hand. The next moment, an electrical shock happened, only, it wasn't on his hand, but on all of his body, sending him screaming as he contorted, and in contorting he worsened the already bad situation of his broken limbs, sending agonizing pain all through his body, till he fainted once more, foam at the corner of his mouth. I hate you, kid. A voice boomed, slowly letting the words echo through the gallery of the sewer-like system he had ended up in. From a prison to a sewer, that was quite an interesting change of scenery. Is this what be called the mindscape? Naruto muttered to himself, being till his waist in the water, and yet not feeling cold, or even wet. Yes the voice came from a set of high metal bars, a gate, which had a seal to act as a key. You are, the Kyubi. Naruto was hesitant, after all, in front of him stood the towering beast of chakra and malice and darkness that had given him hell to pay for half of his life, and that was the reason his soul had been scarred to levels he himself deemed highly impossible to repair. No, I'm the Tooth Fairy. What else do you expect me to be? A pair of enormous red eyes appeared in the pitch black darkness on the other side of the gate, the tone of the voice was caustic, to say the least, as it spoke grievously and with a menacing growl. So, why are we speaking? Naruto had no clue why he was there, did he die? Because I hate you, kid. I now have to give you some of my chakra, or you'll actually die. As he said that, matter of fact, Naruto let the new of his probable death loom in the air for a moment, he kind of felt, relief. He shook his head hard, no, there were people who waited for him, who'd come and save him. There were people who loved him, called him friend. How could he betray them for his selfish whims? Great, I suppose, what was he meant to say? That he'd prefer to die. There's only a problem. The seal hasn't weakened enough, so it will take time and it will hurt you, it will be unbearable, and you will wish you had died, unless you actually remove this piece of parchment here, and then I'll come and help you painlessly. You don't want pain, do you? Naruto was actually tempted to avoid the pain, but between being tempted and actually doing it, there was a difference. He had to mentally thank B for having explained it to him, or he'd actually fall for his trick, as the fox hadn't given much of a word about him taking control of him if he let loose the symbol, or actually destroying him when the fox's chakra would enter his own chakra coils, and a nine-tailed demon's chakra was far more than his own chakra coils could handle. Give me the pain and let's be done with it. He muttered. You sure? You could? Oh, he told you, didn't you? That he did. Naruto nodded. Well, can you fault me for trying to leave a brat's body? I'd be pretty pissed to and being enchained and enslaved without a way out, like I am now. Naruto pointed that out. The thing on your arm will have to go. Nice thing is that while it will discharge on you, you're already knocked out cold so I'll overcharge it, oh, if I give you too much, please do think angry thoughts and hateful words, it helps controlling the chakra. Why do you think it's going to work if B already told me of the tricks of the tailed beasts?